for coming. It's uh, CF5 uh, versus the flying robots. Uh, it's a tough choice, I understand. Uh, my name is Jeremy Heingartner, and uh, I also go by Copious Free Time on Twitter and copiousfreetime.org. Um, and uh, I'm here today to actually confess. I love. <laughs> this is Ruby all here for Ruby. You know, we're going to talk about Ruby, and uh, th this may be a deeper confession. I'm not too sure. Some of you may join in on me. Some of you may not. I like seats. That's what I say. Now, you can you can shame me. All right, all right, all right. My people are here. This is good. This is good. Um, so basically, what we're going to talk about today is Ruby and C, but not in the traditional extension sense. So. Let's do a little couple of quick surveys. Uh, start off with a little raise your hand. Who's a Ruby developer? Raise your hand. Keep them up. I should see every hand in this place up. All right, all right. Keep them up. We're going to go through some nomination rounds. See what happens. Who's written a library? It doesn't have to be public. It can be private. Okay. Does that uh, library have an extension in it? Keep your hand up if it's still the case. We've still got maybe two dozen or so. Is it used by more than one Ruby engine? We have three, four. So I assume your engines are regular in JRuby? Yeah? All right. Cool. What are, what's your library? Yeah? Uh, tornado code. Tornado? No good gear. No good gear. Well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there were two other hands. Uh, Lib Drizzle. Lib Drizzle? I haven't heard of them. I'll try it out. Um, so, our whole goal here is to figure out how we can make, uh, with Ruby, it allows us to, it helps us uh, make extensions and Ruby gems that can be used uh, across, um, across engines, essentially. So, to start with, um, who actually knows what FFI stands for? Everybody, all together, foreign function invocation, yes, yes. Um, and this is the library allows one library written in one language to be invoked by code in a completely um, I'm actually sure how it does it all the way down at the low level with the symbols and everything that happened down uh, in shared library land. But for us, here's our goal. We want to be able to create extensions and gems, gems with extensions, uh, that can be compatible with multiple Ruby engines all at once. So we can say, hey, instead of having to create a specific gem that's for uh, JRuby, a specific gem that's for MRI, another specific gem for MRI on Windows, because if it's Windows, we need to ship the actual the, uh, the, the library might not exist, and, the, um, and there may not be a compiler. So what we're trying to do here is make sure that any extension that you write can be used on multiple engines altogether. So we'll go back a little bit. Libfoo. Everybody's used Libfoo. Yes, yes. It's a great library. It does everything you want. Perfect. <laughs> the absolute perfect library. And uh, you want to use this in your program. Not necessarily Ruby programs, but you want to use it in your program. So, you know, say C, for example, you use the, you use the include header, you compile against it, then it links, and you've got your binary that runs and it links against libfoo. So, we have this. Now, what libffi does is it kind of slides into the middle here between these guys. So, if you have a library, libfoo, and your program wants to use that a function in libfoo, but um, maybe you don't actually have the headers, or it's some... Well, one example, if you could actually link against code that was only object code and there was no way he could actually compile against it, so he used libffi to describe the interface, which was, we'll get to that in a minute, and was able to do it. This is all C to C type stuff. But the benefit of using FFI here is normally when you're compiling, your program needs to link against the library uh, as that final stage and the final linkage. With uh, FFI, your program links against libffi, and then when you run, FFI searches out the function based on, uh, searches out the library and the function based upon runtime information. So instead of linking 
Uh, instead of that final linkage stage, it actually happens all at runtime. So if we take this paradigm, which is, should be fairly familiar with most people, uh, and change it to what we do in Ruby. So we have libfoo, which is you know, this amazing library that we want to use in our Ruby program because you know, it's just awesome. So someone, some brave volunteer goes out and writes Ruby foo the C extension. So the C extension uh, links against the libfoo.so, does all this kind of stuff, and exposes it, hopefully to you, Jim, um, in, and you can load it in Matt's Ruby interpreter, and you can use it in your application. So everybody's you know, at least using the C extension. Now we bring two more members to the party. So we still have Git Ruby, uh, Rubinius, uh, maybe even Maglev, Iron Ruby, any of these other Ruby engines. And you could even consider, um, for this type of thing, the uh, What do we do in these cases? Um, but JRuby can't. So what do you do in this case? So you can either write the same extension again for JRuby, write it in Java, and then you have different gems. You have the JRuby gem for uh, JRuby, and you have the CRuby for Matt's Ruby. But then say someone does something wrong here. Well, then they have to on to the other gem. So what we do is we're going to just get rid of that straight extension and uh, put all of the interpreters all on the same level playing field. All it just means is they're all going to be considered exactly the same in this sense. Insert into that stack uh, libffi, which is the pattern for the uh, Ruby extension, uh, or the FFI gem, which you can use in the Mass Ruby interpreter. And what that does is basically gives you a gem that exposes the FFI uh, library to the Mass Ruby interpreter, and then we'll get into uh, some Ruby code you'll see in just a minute. So then, you actually write your Ruby code uh, from Jam, uh, and it could be that you use the FFI stack to describe uh, the library you're going to write in, and you can use a Hunter API on top of that uh, to show it even further. So we add a new layer to the stack, but everything's going to be added by a new layer of your extension. So um, it's all good. Um, so this is all kind of abstract stuff. Um, we're going to use a uh, simple library. Uh, how many people have used high times before? Sweet. Three people. Yes. Uh, this is a library I wrote that does uh, uh, timing. And uh, one of the sub features of it is it keeps track of stats. Um, and I extracted the little stats piece out and made lib simple metrics. It's a straight C library. It's up on GitHub. Go check it out. Really, really dirt simple. But it provides a really good uh, example for using FFI. Um, so, this is, this is uh, lib simple metrics. Here you see. So, we have a square of numbers, and we've got uh, an even line. Uh, sum of squares, count. Uh, we wanted to add some more symmetry into it. Uh, and we basically have a, uh, a C based, object oriented um, API. We have new, we have free, we have constructor, destructor. Uh, update says, I want to add a new value to this metric. Um, and then we've got our min, man, min, mean, max, sum, count, and standard deviation, and rate. So four, five of those just access the value in the struct, and the other two actually take values in the struct and calculate a new value for every time. So this is the library that we want to expose to Ruby. And we're going to do it a couple of ways. We're going to do it the extension way, we're going to do it the Ruby FFI way, and then we're going to do a little compare and contrast between the two of them. So, what we want here is to take this and convert it into this. In our Ruby interface, here is uh, a metric. We can even start with a string. Here's a metric. We're going to add to it a cell. We can put any string or a cell. And then each time we get a different number here, we just up or we can max to um, the previous one. Am I losing anybody yet? Yeah, it's fading in and out, and I'm not sure why. Okay, we'll use the other one. All right, let's go with this one. That sounds better already. Um, 
So we want we want to take this is our Ruby interface. It works really well. Uh, is there volume on here? Huh? No, it's off. Powered, powered off. Okay, we'll try this. Um, so what we want to take is our Ruby interface here. This is the interface we want to have uh, from that C, li C library to uh, this Ruby interface. So it's kind of a nice little mapping. Um, so this is just a section. The next one, anybody hear me still? Okay, so the next one here, uh, this is the final piece of code to do this as a C extension. Does this look familiar to some folks who have done C extensions? You've got your init method up here, and this basically defines in C the Ruby class and the methods. So the rest of it's above it. And one little thing you can see down here, if it shows up, um, this, the wrapper for this really simple library in, Ru in Ruby C extension, the 167 lines of C in comments. Uh, FYI, the actual lib simple metrics is 105 lines long. So it's kind of a little complex. Not, it's a simple library, so it's not really a good comparison. But you know, it takes, it takes a little bit of work to get a C extension in Ruby, um, but it works out really well. So the next thing we want to do, this is how it looks as a C extension. This is how you describe it in FFI. So another way to, to say what FFI is, it, it is a DSL for describing interfaces. So what we're saying is we have a module, simple metric, module FFI. Um, I'm going to skip that struct piece real quick, and I'll come back to it. Uh, we extend the FFI library. This is actually what pulls in the FFI gem. And then we say, hey, the library that we're going to work with is called libsimplemetrics. And th those two lines right there include FFI, and then that basically says, here's the physical system name for the library that we're going to work with. And then all we do here is describe each method. So we're going to say, I want to attach a function called new. Let me add some new things here. Um, this is our library function as a symbol. The it's basically attach function takes three parameters. The first one is the symbol name of the uh, function you're calling. The second one is an array of the arguments. And the third one is the return. So pretty simple. So we have here new, uh, doesn't take any arguments, returns a pointer. Free, takes a pointer, returns void. You know, update, takes a pointer and a double, returns void. So all these kind of you know, basically map directly to uh, the header file that was a couple slides back. Now, the struct up here says, how does the struct layout in memory, or in the, in the actual physical layout of the struct? We had a min, which is a double, max, which is a double, uh, sum, which is a double, sum of squares is a double, count, which is a long. So these, and these need to be, can you, question? Okay. Um, and so these basically lay out the structure as they were in the header file. And I'll do a side by side here in a little bit. Uh, the other thing we want to do here is like, wouldn't it be really neat if uh, we could actually just tell Ruby to garbage collect this structure when we're done? Well, that's what that release pointer does. So when this object is done, uh, libffi combined with the garbage collector will uh, remove this from your system. So you'd actually have to allocate and deallocate this structure, which is very cool. So we instantiate an object, it's allocated. No more references to it, garbage collector comes by, boom, it's gone. That's very cool. Um, and then this is our Ruby side. So we basically have the FFI and then our Ruby class that stacks on top of it. So this is our metrics class, our, op our optimized, or not our optimized, but our, me our, met our metrics class that we want to actually use in our program. Um, and I've added additional namespace here because we've got the module FFI, I have a module EXT, we'll do a side-by-side -side comparison with them. Um, and simple metrics is just some common stuff between the two, uh, the two different metric implementations. But basically we say, hey, include simple metrics FFI, which is what we just defined on the previous slide. Um, initialize with the name, cool, that sounds great. Um, and then we implement our update method, calling the simple metrics update function that was defined on the previous slide. And then we just add accessors. So we just you know, do some little module eval, manually that's here just to, so it all fit on one slide. So now we do a little side-by-side -side comparison. We have struct, 
This is the Ruby side. There's our C side. Kind of looks really similar. It's kind of cool. And then um, here are the actual functions. So from the Ruby side, we've got all of our functions, simple metrics, new, all the different parameters. Uh, and down here is the C side. And you can kind of see just how they map. So in our case right here, uh, just using Ruby FFI was really not much more than writing the header file for the library we're talking about. It makes it pretty simple. And we didn't, we're not actually doing any C whatsoever. Uh, let's see. So um, some meaningless metrics. When I, ran, when, I, when I developed this the first time, I was like, okay, let's do lib simple metric. Let's do an extension. Let's do um, the Ruby FFI version. And I just kind of timed my own personal time on how long it took me. Um, it took me 40 minutes to you know, do the FFI, basically, that one. And that was a lot because I'm looking at the man pages or the documentation and checking things out. Um, it's one of, one of my earlier ones I ever tried. The traditional C extension took me over an hour. And I've done several C extensions. So I kind of knew how everything flowed. So that's it. Um, one million calls to update. Hey, FFI took a second and some change. And actually, this is probably on a different machine. So these don't apply much anymore. And the traditional C extension took 40.42 seconds. So um, there is an overhead cost for using FFI. And I'll show you an example here in a moment. And uh, then the best part is, hey, this just runs on JRuby, flat out. We're done. And we'll do a demo. So we're actually just going to do a quick little benchmark. Um, so this is the benchmark screen up here, the traditional C extension versus our uh, FFI extension. It's basically where I got those two numbers before. Um, this is just loading up the library. You can see the benchmark. We're going to do, we'll do a million. Um, require the library and then if we have the extension, uh, load it. If we have the FFI, load it. And then basically just run the report. Everybody used benchmark before? It's a nice, happy little library. So, and then we'll print out the comparison and make sure you know, everything looks pretty equal. So, using 107. So all the numbers look good. And here's our, oh, let's do, let's do a million. Let's not, let's do slow. Or too fast. So you can see from the, uh, from the comparison between the C extension and the FFI extension on my MacBook Pro, um, it took about twice as long. And I wouldn't consider this a performance check at all. What we're essentially measuring here is the overhead of using FFI. The, the update method adds the two numbers together. It, it couldn't be considered any type of uh, intensive calculation whatsoever. So essentially what we're measuring here is the overhead of using FFI in a million calls and taking 0.42 seconds of extra time uh, to run versus the extension. So I think that's kind of interesting to know. And for everyone else to know, you know, you, you, there is a little bit of an extra overhead in using FFI because it does have to do an additional layer of, uh, of method calls. But here's the even more fun thing. Same Ruby file. We're just going to use JRuby instead. Oh, wrong number. We want a million. So that's kind of interesting too. I ran it 10 minutes ago and it was not faster. Um, uh, what we have here is this is actually the exact same code, just running in Ruby, accessing libsimple metrics, uh, but it's running in JRuby instead of MRI. So there was no code change whatsoever used. Uh, it could not use the extension, so that failed to load, so it didn't even use it. 
but the FFI run um, did pretty well. It kind of fell in between the two. So we had, what was the other one? I don't remember the other one. Um, so it came in, but you know, as was Java, the, the actual run took less time than the prep run, just because uh, the Java compiler. And it came out with uh, pretty good numbers. But I find that really amazing. You know, you got the same, the same code running in JRuby uh, and MRI that's actually accessing a C library. That's pretty powerful mojo there. Um, so, hey, Noko Geary, awesome. Uh, these are some of the FFI-based projects that are on the, on the wiki for FFI. Um, some of the more amazing ones that I think are pretty cool are FFI OpenGL and FFI OpenCL. So everyone knows about the Snow Leopard. We have OpenCL on these MacBooks. Uh, there's already a library to access all of the OpenCL functions uh, in Ruby. It may be, you know, one of the first languages to be able to access OpenCL besides C and Objective-C, which I think is very, very cool. Uh, another one is Ruby Game. It's in red down here because I wanted to remember to make sure I mentioned it. Uh, Ruby Game has essentially, they use SDL, which is the simple something. I forgot what it was. But basically, it's used for a lot of graphics, audio, um, to, to do two-dimensional graphics, you know, little play-by-play -play games, all sorts of interesting stuff. Uh, the Ruby game has completely altered the entire, their entire infrastructure to use Ruby FFI. So you can have uh, games written in Ruby using the SDL libraries, and they run on Ruby and JRuby, flat out, no problem. It's pretty cool. And because of the Ruby game one, uh, it's actually created the Ruby, S, Ruby SDL FFI and one of the other ones here. Um, another notable one is how many people have used Tokyo Cabinet, Tokyo Tyrant? We've got a few. Um, the Rufus Tokyo Library uh, accesses Tokyo Cabinet and Tokyo Tyrant via FFI. Um, it's still in the, the entire interface isn't implemented, but it's close enough for you know probably 80% of what you need to do, which is very awesome. Uh, let's see. So. Right now, I could take a look at anything else you guys want to look at more in depth. Questions, a little bit? Yes? Composite structs. Composite structs, um, it'll do them. Uh, you basically can create a structure, and then one of your, actually, I can go back a bit. Okay. Oh. Okay. Oh, the problem with my business. Um, so your layout here. Uh, I believe you can reference previous classes in your layouts, and it works that way. Uh, unions, I don't remember if it does off the top of my head right now or not. I think it probably will. Um, a couple of the other more advanced type C things, it does callbacks, uh, function pointers, you know, function pointers returning function pointers, all sorts of things like that. Um, but it, it does do all of those. Sure. Yeah, it's actually called FFI SIG generator. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it uses the output. I don't remember if it's on my. Uh, um, oh, it's not on. It's not listed on the wiki. But yes, there is the FFI SWIG generator, which can use I think a SWIG.i file and just generate the Ruby code for it, so which is. Yeah, and I think that's actually how the FFI OpenGL one was created and maybe the OpenCL one. Yeah. Yes? No, it's actually, um, I'm not, well, we can talk to Wayne <laughs> if he's here. I don't know if he is or not. Um, but the way it works in JRuby is libFFI is just built into JRuby. It's just compiled straight in and it just exposes uh, all of this type of stuff to it. There's actually a fake uh, JRuby FFI gem that just inserts the dependency here. It doesn't actually do anything. 
because other people that are using, making gems that use FFI, they say, oh, I depend on FFI. Let me try to use it on JRuby. It fails. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of uh, really good examples on the FFI wiki. Um, and let me see. Here they are. Here's the link. Oh, that's not good. Um, these are the links. Uh, GitHub, they actually transitioned away from the Kanai location onto uh, GitHub. Um, and so these are the best places right now. There's been a lot of activity on the uh, Groovy route. Um, and Wayne has a blog, uh, rarely blogs, but you know, notable stuff gets put on there. And that one. So keep on coming with more questions. I can go more in depth into some examples. Yes? How do you actually make the gem file itself? Like, is it more or less the same as a normal C extension? Uh, there actually is no C extension. It's just Ruby code. So let's go look. I don't actually have this gemified, but I can show you basically what it looks like. Here, come back here. So this is the full FFI that's used. Um, this is actually pretty much what was on that slide uh, that I showed you. This file right here, you just require um, at the top level well, let's take, take one step back. So normally when you have a library, uh, you have your code, uh, you say, hey, I'm gonna require simple metrics. In this case, simple metrics goes and requires all the different structures that are necessary in your system uh, and loads everything up. So in our case, um, in the top level, you would just say require simple metrics FFI, which would define your interface right here. And then, just by including, just by requiring your definition file, this DSL, um, and it requires FFI itself. Uh, and then, when you, by requiring FFI, you get this FFI managed struct in this namespace. And extending the library makes this module essentially attached to that library. And when you actually use it, I'll show you that code in just a second. Um, this basically defines it all. So this is really all you have to do is just this one file and then require it. And then you using it, you would say, let's see, let's go. That's that one. So actually using it, you, you just call it. So in this class, this is our top level metric class. And it included simple metrics FFI, which is this one right here, just this module. I happen to have them in the same file. Maybe it's confusing at the moment. So this module defines the simple metrics, essentially the API. We can call this the API module. And uh, this will basically define these functions or these methods on it, and then you can call them directly. So right here. Um, we're allocating a new implementation. So this is essentially attaching to the API, saying, uh, get me a new instance of that API. And then whenever I want to call it, um, I call simple metrics update. Or this, actually, is the, uh, this one invokes the lower level C method uh, and gets you a new simple metrics. You store it here. And then right here is actually calling simple metrics update. And this is calling that method right there. And you're passing it in essentially the structure, which is which is this. That's the add implementation is essentially the allocated memory for that structure. And then that one. It's really, really simple. Yes? FFI dot simple metrics new, but below you're doing simple metrics updates. Why is one um, method, the one of them is this right here. So you, this uh, simple metrics update is a method in this. Uh, it's a method in this uh, module you include right here. So we're calling it. So those methods get injected in here. But one of the parameters for simple metrics update is essentially um, the structure. 
seems to structure. They all take a pointer as the first parameter. So you're calling this one and you're saying, okay, here's my parameters that I'm calling it with, but you still have to allocate the structure that gets passed to it. Right, but you're not calling the f of y back. No, 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 no. Yeah, I'm including the module up here. So here's the module, simple metrics FFI, and it gets included right here. And so that attached function attaches the uh, C function into this Ruby module. And so Uh, actually, no. Let's find out. I guess not. <laughs> it all works. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to learn something in your own presentation. Yes. The JNI thing. Okay. It uses libf5, but it does have a little JNI wrapper around it. And with the JRuby binaries, we ship 32 and 64 bit versions for um, uh, Windows, Linux, Darwin, uh, FreeBSD, and, and Z Linux for all people doing Linux on mainframes here. <laughs> okay. that. Uh, it, yeah, it does have a little, a little JNI shim that actually just boots the okay. five stuff. Cool. <coughs> awesome. Yes. I'd also say about JRuby, not, there are JRuby platforms that can't run F5, so that won't go big time on the back. Say again? There are JRuby platforms that can't run Z sentences. Okay. So that, if you right. want to cover yeah. all your bases with JRuby correctly, you probably have to write a Java implementation. But for most people who are using JRuby as like a VM instead of MRI, that's why it's fine. Yeah. Does everybody hear that? Um, so I'm actually much faster than I thought I was going to be. So questions, comments, we can keep up the discussion or we can have an early break, whatever you like. Or you can talk about something else. <laughs> All right, well, thanks.